Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the uh, Ways and Means Committee um, hearings uh, for Council Bill. Give me the bill number. Twenty-two-zero. 235 ordinance of estimates um, I'm Odette Ramos um, 14th district uh, members of the committee will be joining us in a minute but we wanted to stay on schedule um, so we're here with the environmental control board um, and how many slides do you have you've just got one one big one excellent okay uh, so, um, Environmental Control Board, so uh, Director Woods, if you could just introduce yourself and also any of your team members that are here. Any team members that you want to speak can come up to the microphones. Um, did you want to, I know you've, She's you know. here for support, but I don't think she'll need to speak. Oh, okay, sure, yeah, and just make sure, and I need to make sure I do this too, hold the microphone close by, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much, Councilwoman Ramos. My name is Rebecca Woods. I am the Executive Director of the Environmental Control Board. I'm here with Brittany Vendries, and she is the Deputy Director of the Environmental Control Board. And as you said, we have one slide, so I'm ready to jump in whenever. Sure, go for it. Okay. The Environmental Control Board is tasked with offering a hearing process for respondents who receive environmental citations issued by other city agencies. Uh, the violations that fall under the ECB are in Article 1, Section 40-14 of the Baltimore City Code, and those um, ordinances touch on health, safety, and quality of life issues. The um, ECB is also tasked with hearing water bill disputes coming out of DPW, um, and our overall goal as far as the, the code violations is to change behavior. And we do that through our hearing process, which is an educational process. Uh, we also have a diversion program for first-time offenders, um, and that's an education course in lieu of the hearing. And then we also offer Be More Beautiful, which is the peer-to-peer -peer beautification network. We use those three things to try to change behavior around cleanliness and beautification. Um, I do have two performance measures that are highlighted on the slide. The first is the percentage of violators who reoffend after completing the diversion program. Our target's always zero. I think that's um, kind of a reach, but, but we want the education class to be enough to prevent for further, sorry, further citations. Um, but we were at 4%, which I'm actually pretty proud of. We did really ramp up our diversion program through um, the course of the pandemic, we used that time to really divert as much as we could and still offer diversion while we weren't quite ready to offer the hearing process yet as we were figuring out how to switch to remote. So we still had that operating. Our community liaisons are the ones who do the diversion program. And I think the most successful portion of that program is the ability to answer other questions that have nothing to do with the citation. Um, I have two fantastic liaisons, Natasha Neal and Brandy um, Welsh, and, and they know a whole lot of stuff about the city and they answer all kinds of city service questions and they can direct people to other um, relevant agencies and a direct point of contact in those agencies. I get a whole lot of feedback from them about the, the quality of the conversations and I think it's a really helpful um, and beneficial program. So I'm, I'm happy with our 4%. Uh -huh. um, the other performance measure up there is percentage of first hearing scheduled within 60 days, and obviously we have a lot of work to be done. Um, we were significantly impacted, as everyone was, by the pandemic. We, we did not have a hearing process up and running for quite some time because we were working through um, an efficient and effective remote process. We tried Teams ad nauseum. I mean, we tried everything we could. We ended up going with Zoom for government. Um, we found that that works the best for external users. It's user friendly. We can walk people through that fairly easily. We can get the most um, respondents involved in the remote process by using Zoom. So there is an enhancement that we were awarded this year for this coming up fiscal year for the Zoom for government, which was 5,000. And that's, that covers all of our licenses for employees and for our hearing officers. Um, that's all I had prepared. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Just wanted to acknowledge uh, Council Vice President Middleton joining us today. Um, I did have a couple of questions. So you, you had to switch pretty quickly um, during the pandemic to be able to reschedule everyone. And I did see that you had that bump up request to be able to continue the subscription to, to Zoom. And Zoom is so much better than Teams. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that's good. I'm glad. Um, so uh, how many of you, I have some questions, and then we'll go to uh, members. Um, how many of, of your staff um, are speak Spanish, or how do you handle things when um, you don't have you have a Spanish speaker that can't, or any other language speaker? Sure. So I don't have anyone fluent. I have some that can kind of piece together enough to get to get through a basic conversation. But we use Language Line all the time. We we have um, Language Line. I think we probably are one of the higher users because anytime there's a hearing um, and we need interpretation that we use language line. So our hearing officers are well versed in using language line and my staff has become also well versed. So if somebody comes into the agency and they need assistance, we use language line right there on the phone in, in front of the respondent. When someone calls in, we'll, we'll link in language line as well. We've had a lot of success with it. So I don't have any, any challenges in being able to reach anyone that, that does not speak um, English as their first language. We're we're also working with the mayor's office to um, translate some of our documents, our regularly used documents. Mm -hmm. uh, we did recently join the, the mayor's office um, uniform uh, account for language lines so that it's even uh, more easy to, to get access to. I mean, we, we've been using it for years, but um, it's just nice to have that blanket account that, that we can join other agencies in using. Yeah, that, that's great. I think I, I've um, tried to emphasize that our front-facing um, workers should definitely, you know, we have some that speak Spanish or, you know, because that's our, or next to English, that's our next prominent language. Um, but I'm glad that to hear that language line has been, um, has been working out. Um, also, Councilman Dorsey from the third district is here. Um, my second question is, um, and you and I were just talking about this. Uh, we've worked with DHCD to, uh, with uh, vacant abandoned property to really ramp up the enforcement process. Um, and they're giving instead, in addition to the $100 glass and weeds, they're giving citation, the $900 VBM citations, which is getting people's attention, obviously, because we had been told um, uh, more appeals are coming um, as a result. Can you talk a little bit about um, how that's going, who you're seeing? Are you seeing families that have been not taking care of grandmom's house, or are you seeing contractors? Like, what's that, what's happening there? I'm just curious. Sure, so we are certainly seeing more, um, but it's it's a wide array of, of who's coming in. I mean, we certainly do have um, relatives whose um, mom or someone else in the family hasn't been taking care of the property or that person has moved to a different location and then is not also dealing with that property. Um, new owners, uh, we see a lot of new owners who there's a va open vacant building notice on a property oh, and they didn't, yeah. they didn't know about it. it. It does show up on the lien sheet, but I, I think um, a lot of title companies aren't worried about that in the sale because there's no fine associated with the actual notice until you get the citations. So we have a lot of new homeowners who have an open vacant building notice in a newly rehabbed house and they're distraught. I mean, well, I would we, be. We passed a law that was enacted in October to outlaw that they can't do that anymore that's good to know I did not know that so yeah so um, and it was my bill um, basically the seller has to disclose um, that there's a vacant building notice on the property because a lot of times title companies either are lazy there are only a few that are actually worth their salt um, and or they want to get the sale done really quickly and they don't wait for the lien sheet and so someone walks into a property that they think is totally rehabbed and they're starting to get VBNs um, and citations. And so they may end up in tax sale, right? So that was one of the reasons why we brought this uh, up is to prevent that. So now the, um, the seller has to, as of October 1st, the seller has to disclose. Um, and um, whereas we couldn't put in a private right of action in our bill, GBBR, the Greater Baltimore Board of Realtors, put that disclaimer in their Baltimore contracts and that way, folks can walk away if um, they they don't want to deal with vacant buildings. So hopefully, you're seeing folks from prior to October 21. Because if you're not, that's a whole different ballgame. I'll take a closer look at that because we get that regularly, and and I understand you know the fear and outrage that comes with somebody who for the first time is realizing that there's an open VBN, and it sometimes requires a whole lot of money and a whole lot of work on something they weren't anticipating. Exactly, and it's because we do have um, some uh, folks who are rehabbing these houses. I think you mentioned it before, and and I know uh, Chris Burnett, and it happens in my district that you know they're just 
they're not even going through the process or they didn't get proper permits or whatever and so they didn't in order to take the vacant building notice off you have to get the use and occupancy so right. that's a whole lot of inspections it's a whole lot of everything so uh, so it, it was enacted October 2021 okay. so if you're seeing folks from after October 2021 then they actually have they can legally take action that's good to know and I'll look into all that so I can properly yeah, but if it's before that. October 2021 Right. The law wasn't enacted, but DHCD usually is good at working with folks. Yes. Um, so if, if you don't mind getting back to me on that, that would be super sure. cool. Absolutely. Too. Yeah. Um, and just to say a little bit more about those citations, they do, and we were just speaking about this, they do take a little bit longer in the hearing process, so we allot for more time for those hearings because yeah. Um, it's my goal to have someone walk away from the hearing fully understanding why they were cited, what they need to do next, how to be in compliance. So we'll schedule usually about two in an hour of the fail to abates compared to you know multiple of the $50 citations that we can get through much faster, which impacts our ability to, to meet our um, performance measures for scheduling. But I think it's so important that we need to find that balance. So yeah, for sure. um, I, I'm going to continue to do that because I think that's so important and you're talking about a lot of money too so there's a lot at stake and i think that um, we need to have a thorough process and, and the hearing officers um, we have regularly regular training with them to go over um, you know the things that they're seeing so we can talk some of that out so that so that there's a better understanding going into the hearings but i think our hearing officers do a pretty good job of articulating what needs to be done and making sure the inspectors are also articulating that yeah great so just Let's stay in touch about that piece. Absolutely. Um, because if, if folks are coming in after they bought a house after October, that, then they're in like the seller's in big trouble. <laughs> so we want to take care of that because it's not fair to the homeowner. So, um, but they are at least coming in and, and using the hearing process. I do know where some are just like, oh, this is an error. So, right. Yeah. And um, one of the other things that we're trying to um, work on implementing, it's been tough because of the volume and, and trying to catch up from not having hearings for a little while because of the pandemic, but I'm looking to start a pilot for um, a, an FTA docket, essentially, where mm. we would schedule all the first time, keep going in and out, the first time, um, Cita the, the citation schedule for the first time on a on a docket that the hearing officer is making sure that they're advised of everything that needs to be done, if there's multiple things that, that need to be addressed, and then instead of having a disposition that day, reschedule them to come in for status checks. Um, oh, that's a good you know, idea. It's, it's my goal not to collect a certain, and BBMR might not want to hear this, but not, not to collect a certain amount of money. <laughs> my goal is, and I, and I know housing's goal too, is to get people in compliance. And continuously finding without work being done isn't solving that. And also a lot of folks need to spend the $900 on the house to get the house um, where it needs to be or the property where it needs to be, not $900 on fines. So right. we're looking That's at right. yeah. figuring out ways to, um, to it's kind of a, a a way of doing another diversion. You know, it, it, the $50 diversion cases are learn about why you were in violation, what you need to do to be in violation. Here's some other suggestions of how to be in compliance. But this is going to be a whole different level of a, of a diversion, but I think it will be very effective. Yeah, I'm glad you're doing it that way. That's super important because you're right. If folks actually want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. They're going to need the money to do the right thing. So let's guide them through the process. Um, so that that's one, that's great. Um, so yeah, it's just been a very frustrating um, thing to try to deal with this. Um, Madam Vice President, do you have any questions? Um, th uh, thank you, Councilwoman. Um, you pretty much kind of covered uh, some of the housing things and some of the problems that we're, we have with, with the permitting process and um, the flippers that are buying and flipping homes and um, I guess just one thing to add, and I gave this question also to transportation, we also get an abundance again of those we buy signs that are posted everywhere that are just terrible. The, and are you, do your inspectors uh, pull those down and make calls to I think it's housing. So they're not, yeah, they're not my inspectors. It's under housing. We offer the hearing process side of it. But I do know that um, uh, Dave McGinnis is now the chief of the Special Investigations Unit, and that's kind of one of his pet peeves. <laughs> you know, if we oh, see, he is. We see him on walks in. taking them down, and he, I mean, he'll spend hours and hours researching them. I think uh, they're as thorough as they possibly can be because I know that's a big concern of theirs. But we hear the, we have the hearing side of it. Not very many of them come in for a hearing, but um, it's definitely one of the violations that falls under the ECB if there is a hearing. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for what you continue to do to sure. to help our city and uh, trying to keep a safe and and help healthy environment. Thank you. It. Thanks. 
Great. Uh, Councilman Dorsey, do you have any questions? No, Rebecca is great <laughs> and utter, utterly fair uh, with the people to whom I, uh, the, the people I refer to her, and um, utterly reasonable um, and straightforward and goes above and beyond to find explanations for things that are simply not her responsibility when it's confusing. Yeah. And which it is for a lot of people, and it's confusing for me, the delineation of like writing a citation and appealing to ECB and all that stuff. And you know, it's just utterly, utterly reasonable. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one other question. And, and I'll say reasonable is an exceptional standard <laughs> in government, I would say. Like reasonable is not a bar that I find met all too often. Right. Exceeding reasonable is what we have here, and you should be very proud. To Thank you very much. Exceeding reasonable. Can we get like t-shirts? ECB. Exceeding <laughs> I think what reasonable. I have those made. <laughs> well, there's the Be More Beautiful uh, Yes, we'll swag. add that as a tagline, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councilman. Thank you, Councilman. Um, uh, you're now also getting the um, appeals for water bills. Um, so how is that going? Um, it's going. We had to figure out a process, so that took some sure. time. Um, I think that we have one hearing officer in particular who is handling them because we wanted some consistency and, and someone to be well-versed. Um, you know, my hearing officers are responsible for hearing so much of the code, so we really wanted somebody to be able to dig in and really yeah. thoroughly understand what's going on. Um, I think he does an excellent job. Um, I've gotten very positive feedback um, of his fairness, of his willingness, willing, willingness to listen to all parties, and I think that's crucial. Um, I feel like people feel like they've been heard once they leave the process. We've seen a, a dramatic increase in the requests for hearings, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, you know we have a good working relationship with DPW to have conversations when things aren't going as smoothly, and, and we have a very good partner in DPW. I'm, I'm happy to be able to provide the service that we provide. Yeah, I think that's um, the, you know that came out of the Water Affordability um, Equity and Accountability Act, and um, soon there will be an office of the um, consumer advocate at DPW that you will probably have more um, engagement with. Absolutely. Um, uh, but having that appeal process is super important for folks, um, especially since the water bill uh, piece, I, I think DPW is doing a better job of um, resolving those issues. They really beefed up their personnel and all of that, but there's always, you know, we needed to have an appeal process. So thanks for taking that on. <laughs> Happy to do it. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Um, so that's it for me. Do you have anything else? None. Okay. Councilman Dorsey, do you have anything else? Okay, so um, thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate it. Thanks for all of your work. Um, and we'll be in recess until 3 o'clock. Thanks. Thank you.